So there's. Okay, thanks. Got it. God, I hate this. It's not so bad when you have to do this every month, but God, to, to come on like this, it's crazy. Uh, okay, so there's no, there's nothing I have to read except I guess I could say that in accordance with our own policy T that we approved last November 22nd, we can have uh, up to two virtual meetings a year. This is one, and they just can't be in a row. So we chose to, to do this, and we're doing it now. The presentation from the library director. Are you ready? I am. I will okay. share my screen and bring up the PowerPoint. Uh -huh. Just so everybody knows, I have no visual. I will oh, okay. try and be very detailed, but I will also share the PowerPoint tomorrow morning so that you have it as well for, for backup reference. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. So your presentation tonight is on some recent library trainings and library safety measures. Just a, a little bit of info. There have been a number of questions at recent board meetings from trustees about the compilation documents that you all receive that give kind of a snapshot of the incidents that happen in our facilities every month. And this is just a, an opportunity for a little bit more information. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the county's opioid task force, the recent revive training that library staff had the opportunity to attend, a little bit about our incident reporting process, trends that we've seen recently, and some updated library safety measures that we've taken in light of some of the, the issues that we've been seeing in our facilities. So the first is just a little bit of background in case folks weren't aware. Um, our county has taken the opioid epidemic very seriously and they put in place an opioid task force several years ago now at this point. The opioid task force lives underneath the umbrella of the county's community services board and they work in collaboration with other agencies like the health department to try and provide trainings to the community to ensure that people are aware of what uh, opi opioids can do to people who um, uh, overuse them uh, and they're not in a medically pre prescribed circumstances and to ensure that the public is aware that this really is a, a public health crisis. A lot of times when you hear people talking about the opioid epidemic, you think about it in more rural communities, uh, but it has certainly infiltrated and reached into Fairfax County. The graphic that you see on the left side of the screen is a portion of um, like an annual update that the task force provides, and it gives a little bit of information about the number of uh, fatal overdoses that we've seen in the county. This was for uh, fiscal year 2022, so very, very recently, as well as the emergency room visits and the um, the number of people who have participated in uh, diversionary programs. You may also have recently heard about uh, opioids due to some of the uh, incidences that have happened in the public school systems and um, the unfortunate um, health crisis that is going along with that. So while our library system is not uh, part of the health system in the county, we certainly want to make sure that we are well trained and equipped to help people to come through our doors because we are an open public space and we see a lot of folks walking in every day. So recently, we provided the opportunity for any FCPL staff who wanted to participate in the Revive Opioid Overdose and Naloxone Education Program. This is a training series that's offered by the Community Service Board to uh, educate our staff on how to identify someone who might be in the process of overdosing and how to administer naloxone, which is a, a opioid uh, overdose reversal drug. We made this entirely voluntary. Staff do not have to participate. Uh, and even if they have gone through the training, they do not have to act in the case of an emergency if they are not comfortable doing so, or if they have uh, changed their mind, or if they're just frozen in the moment. This was an opportunity for them to get more educated if they wanted to. And the training also provides free doses of naloxone to everyone who participates. At this point, we've had more than 100 staff members participate, including staff at each of our uh, physical library branches, and we have that naloxone available in each of those branches. Um, we are choosing to ensure that they are uh, readily available, both for our staff and for others if, if need be, so they are co-located with our AED machines, 
and then additional ones are are located off site so that we can restock if needed. Um, to be clear, though, we have not had overdoses in our facilities. Uh, we have been very fortunate that uh, while we have certainly had some drug related incidents and we have had uh, people going through health crises in our facilities, we have not seen the the types of opioid overdoses happening in our facilities that many other urban library systems have seen. Uh, part of that might be because we we don't have a central core, a downtown area like many other urban systems, but in general, we have seen a much lower rate of, of incidents and particularly um, things like this with overdoses than, than other big urban systems. This is really just to be prepared and to allow our staff this opportunity for training if they chose to participate. <coughs> Um, part of the reason that we wanted to talk about the revive training was because there have been a number of incident reports lately that you all have seen in your packets that are related to substance abuse. And I thought this would be a really good opportunity to share a little bit with you about why we draft incident reports, what they look like, what they're used for, banning, and the type of incidents that we see in our facilities, because you get them once a month. And I know some folks read them very diligently, some folks might scan them. But unless you're looking at them all in a sequential order, you might not be picking up on all the trends that, you're, that are happening in our facilities. So our incident reporting process is very structured. We have a problem behavior manual that allows our staff to have a very clear understanding of what is an issue in our facilities and what might, uh, might not be, how to respond to those incidences, they include draft language and having conversations with people or with handling them, and then how to document them. We have a separate incident reporting process so people can understand, uh, you know, these are eventually could be legal documents. So we wanna make sure that they are clear, they're concise, they're well-written, and they're not done in the moment when we might have more uh, kind of emotions tinging what has uh, just recently occurred. The incident reporting documents are really based off of the code of conduct. So, you know, everyone is welcome in our facilities, and as long as they abide by that code of conduct, they're welcome to stay and use library spaces. But if they start violating that, if they're uh, verbally abusing staff, if they're engaging in erratic behavior, if they're tampering with library equipment, um, any of the lists that you can see on the far side there on the types of incidents, then that is a violation of the code of conduct. They're often presented with the code of conduct to ensure that they know what the violation is, given opportunities to rectify that behavior if it is not anything that is serious or violent in the moment. Um, and then we continue to document it. Documenting those incidents means that if we have repetitious behavior, we have a better case if they need to be uh, either removed from a single facility or from all of our facilities. <coughs> um, and for us to track issues as they crop up. Uh, our libraries are operated by FCPL, but we do not own the facilities. The facilities are owned by the county. And the county also has a separate county security department that does things like support us in uh, assessing our physical assets and in helping us ban patrons that maybe have either had single very um, egregious um, breaches of our code of conduct or more repetitious pattern that means that they are not a good fit for our spaces at this time. So that's kind of the process that we use. The graphic on the left side was a, a really quick breakdown of the types of incidences that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, and I'll go into more details on the next slide. This is a breakdown of the number, the volume of incidents that we have, we've seen over the last couple of years, as well as the most frequent types of incidents. And at first I just like, I was gonna do a three year block because I figured, oh, that's a pretty good data set. And then I remembered we had a pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's not really great data. <laughs> So I, I went as far as the page would let me go with it still being a reasonable font size. Um, so if you discount really 2020 and 2021, we typically have about, um, you know, 300 documented incidents a year. And uh, incredible praise for our wonderful staff who are ensuring that not only are people appropriately using our facilities, but when there are violations of that code of conduct, they are timely and factually and concisely ensuring that we have that documented, um, that it's, it's everything there in case we need it. Um, I also thought it would be interesting just to show you the most frequent types of incidents that we have. You can see across the board, it is 
other, and I itemized that on the bottom for you with a couple. Other is really just a big catch-all category. And I went through and looked at a bunch of our recent incident reports, and some of the things that that captured were uh, inappropriate use of facilities. Uh, we had someone who threw their shoes up on top of a light fixture. That was other use. Uh, when the police come in and want to engage with people in our space that we haven't asked them to come forward for, but we have identified that it's happening. Uh, it's when people might bring in several large bags or backpacks and they might take up three computer spaces instead of one. Uh, a lot of fire issues lately. Uh, when we placed the mulch recently, we had several small mulch fires. Those all get captured under other. Um, animals in the facility, either non-service animals or wild animals that have accidentally made themselves into buildings, uh, children underage that have been left alone, all those kinds of things just get wrapped up into the category of other. But what you'll see under you know, the second and third most frequent categories, it is pretty regularly things like erratic behavior, verbal abuse, camping and trespassing. And then in this last year, we have certainly seen an uptick in substance abuse, both uh, suspected use and suspected sales. <coughs> In response to seeing trends in those incident reports, those documentations, we pay really, really, really close attention to those. So when our colleagues in the branches submit a draft incident report, someone in library administration, either myself or the deputy, our branch coordinators, or our currently vacant administrative services director position, reviews, responds, makes any edits that might be necessary, and is generally aware of everything that is going on with those. And when we see trends occurring, we have a kind of suite of options that we can look at. Um, we can certainly look at banning people, which is why we try and make a good solid case. We never want to remove people from a public space that they have you know, paid for with their taxes unless we have either got a sustained long-term issue of the same types of repeat behaviors or it's a single instance that's really egregious. And we wanna make sure that we're not violating people's ability to use these public spaces, which is why we, we document so frequently. Uh, but banning is certainly on the table. We usually start with a single location, uh, but in some instances, we might look at doing it system-wide. We also look at short and long-term security coverage. We have been, um, we've had a long-term security guard at the Reston facility. And in the past year, we have had short and midterm security guards at Centerville, Thomas Jefferson, and Richard Bird for a variety of issues. Uh, some of those have been really short term, just to handle a, a, a short term issue or a group of folks that are using the facilities. Uh, some of them are, are longer term when there are um, more systemic or community issues that we don't have as much control over. Um, so we do look at funding those and placing those as needs dictates. And we pretty regularly assess those as well to make sure that the need is still there and that we don't either need to shift that or just remove it entirely. When we think that there are facility issues, we co coordinate with our colleagues in county security to do a site assessment. That might uh, lead us to down the road of either getting additional um, security cameras, mirrors, signage, uh, parking lot support, any number of those things. And then we have to fund those and have them added through the county process. Um, we work with our local PD substations and the police department has been fabulous to work with in almost all instances in both supporting us as we uh, remove people from the facility that are not able to use it appropriately and in ensuring that uh, we are having open ability for conversation about community concerns. Uh, we provide additional staff training, like I mentioned with the naloxone, but recently we also instituted a system-wide mandatory training on both our incident reporting process and our code of conduct. <clears throat> and we try to ensure that we have appropriate signage to discourage things like camping, loitering, and trespassing where appropriate. Of course, people are always welcome to use their public facilities. We just don't want people, you know, pitching a stake in, and building a home on a, a space that is really meant for uh, more transitory use. And then the last bullet I included in there was working with community groups. We've had really great cooperation with many community groups who have been trying to assist our community groups. The community groups have been trying to assist specific groups of people with specific issues around things like substance abuse or um, 
folks that are camping because they are otherwise unhoused. So we've been able to coordinate with them to ensure that we are leading people to the right resources and not simply removing them from the premise. So that is uh, about what I wanted to share with you. I am, of course, happy to answer any questions. I will stop sharing my screen, though, so that you can see each other's faces. Uh, I see a hand from Phil and then one from Suzanne. Uh, Phil, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. No, it's fine. I see Phil twice. I'm confused here. <laughs> <laughs> I also see Phil twice. Yeah, Phil, you had your hand up and then Suzanne. But... Did you say me, Gary? Did you call on me, Gary, or, or Liz? Uh, yeah, I thought you had your hand raised. Yeah, I did. Uh, Jessica, the question you're talking about, we have the security. So like, like, where are the security? You know, let's say I'm at the library today and somebody's doing whatever. Or let's say making an issue. How long does it take before security can get there? It's a great question. So it depends, I suppose, on where the issue might be happening and um, where the security guard is at the specific time something is occurring. But generally, the security guards have been really great to work with. They have stations near the front entrance that they start at, but they do loops around the facility just to make sure that things are fine, both interior and exterior. Um, we've had really, really great folks that have been coming in and filling those shifts for us. So it's really pretty quick if we have security guards on site. Additionally, uh, many of the PD substations, when we have issues that need a call to the police, been very quick to respond as well. They they know that we're a public space and that we're trying to ensure uh, good use of that public space and the safety for everyone who's there. Okay, Suzanne, you had a question? Yeah, I just, in looking at the report today, Jessica, you also have disruptive behavior, which I didn't see on the list. I um, know- So, th I'm so sorry, I missed the last part there. Oh. I know I'm being picky, but I saw on this month's report, there was disruptive behavior, which I didn't see on the column. Sure, so um, the column tapered down. Um, it didn't include okay. everything. And oftentimes okay. we bundle disruptive and erratic. Um, okay. there is I a, wondered if how- There is um, a distinction somewhere in there. I don't know that I can tell you what is off the top of my head, uh, but really erratic <laughs> behavior, which is you know folks that are using the facility and maybe the ways that they are not anticipated to be used. Uh, verbal abuse, uh, trespassing, loitering, those are kind of the, the ones that happen most regularly. I also noticed that in, 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 I don't know what's happening. I also noticed in Fairfax City that someone is listed as being trespassed from a store or something. Have you heard that term? Sure. So there are two separate terms. So okay. banning is the process that the county goes through to remove someone from either one facility or, excuse me, um, either one facility or from all of our facilities. Trespassing is a process that the police do. So say we have someone who comes into a facility and they are acting in a way that really does not constitute what they should be doing in a public library and they need to be removed. Um, if we don't have a ban in place, which can take a day or two, um, then the police can issue a, uh, a notice to trespass. It's a form that they can do out in the moment that our local staff can sign off on. We then follow up with a ban if it's appropriate, but the police can issue those in, in a in more succinct time frame. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Are there any other questions or comments? I just have a comment. Liz, um, Jessica, thank you so much for the report. I look at these uh, the data every month, and I have been alarmed over some of the, you know, the, what I would uh, say would be violent or uh, uh, very aggressive behavior and the drugs, etc. So I'm glad about the staff has received training. That's a huge number, a hundred. I'm not sure how many are, are uh, total numbers of staff, but. Um, I'm really pleased to hear the report as well as the training that staff have received. And hopefully, I don't remember what they're called, those guns, those little antidotes for uh, opioids. Um, Naloxone. Uh, hopefully. Naloxone. Yeah, thank you. So mm -hmm. I'm pleased that we were able to provide them free to mm -hmm. anybody who was interested in getting them. Um, and it's great. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So the 100 of our employees is about 20 like 18% of our staff, maybe 20% of our staff. So 
because we've offered it voluntarily, we're not requiring anyone to take it. Um, this, we thought that was a really good starting place, particularly since we have at least one employee at each branch that has been trained, which means we have mm -hmm. that available to all of our facilities. And for anyone um, on the board, if you ever have questions about the report that you receive that is the kind of succinct review of the monthly incidents, I'm happy to talk about them um, either one-to-one -one or, or in future meetings. We certainly um, have had some incidents that have been a little bit more uh, aggressive or uh, abrupt in the last year or so than, than anyone would like to see happen in our public spaces, which has required some additional training and opportunities to ensure that our staff feel safe and welcome and able to do their jobs really well. But it's also why we try and respond pretty quickly if there is a need to do things like assign a short or midterm security guard so that we can put a stop to the behavior, ensure that we have support for staff on site, and hopefully break a pattern of either an individual person using a facility in an appropriate way or a group of people who might be doing something that is uh, not really welcome in our public facilities. You, you may have said it, but are there are not security cameras at every facility, right? Every branch. Uh, no. So all of our new facilities have been designed with security cameras, all, all interior, some exterior, but mostly interior spaces. And we have had need to go back and retrofit some of our older facilities with security cameras as well, mm -hmm. but it is not an all. So we've ensured that as we renovate, that they're all built in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Jessica, yeah. are those security cameras actively man uh, monitored or is it just for tape for going back and looking at it? They are not actively monitored. It's to go back and review if needed. Okay. Any other questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Jessica. I appreciate absolutely. that. Now we can move on with the meeting. I have uh, this introduction that Bobby sent me here. Let's see. If Okay, this is pretty standard. The library board wishes to provide an opportunity for the public to comment on library related issues. It's our policy to hear a maximum of 10 speakers at each regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are limited to one public comment during a six month period. Each speaker has a maximum of three minutes for their comments. 30 second warning will be given before each speaker's time is up and speaker will be expected to end promptly when time is called. Speakers are requested to pre-register with the library director. However, if there are available public comments slots open at the time of a board meeting, the remaining slots may be filled by individuals registering at the meeting. Board members will listen to, but not question or respond to speakers, and tonight there are no registered speakers. In the future, yeah, there's a few people here. If anyone wishes to speak at a future meeting, please call the director's assistant at 703-324-8324. Next, we move on to the minutes. Did everyone take a look at them? Does anyone have any changes or corrections? I sent mine in. You I sent, sent yours in. Oh, yes. Why am I not surprised? Okay. <laughs> no, let me get it. Okay. And that, that being the case, then the minutes are approved with uh, Fran's correction. <laughs> I presume it was grammatical. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Yes. I figured that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Now for the chair's report. Uh, one thing that uh, has uh, we've decided to do uh, based on um, I forget who it was who suggested it. Maybe Suzanne, Fran, maybe others. But uh, to try to uh, uh, bring out the accomplishments of of retirees. Fairfax County Public Library retirees. Uh, and uh, I have a list of them that uh, has been sent to me uh, of the those few who have retired since the beginning of the year. So uh, I will read those into the record. Is that what you had in mind, I presume, Jessica? Okay. Uh, I don't see any uh, here. Uh, the first one is Carolyn Lab or Labby. Okay. LeBay. 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 He was an info librarian at Tyson's Pimmet who retired on January 28th. She worked at Tyson's for the bulk of her FCPL career. In 2007, she began as, TY, as Tyson's uh, technical expert, keeping Tyson's equipment and staff updated. She was a stalwart supporter of community programming, facilitating adult book groups, English conversation groups, 
starting a citizenship course at Tyson and hosting regular installments of Medicare 101 information sessions. So congratulations, Carolyn. I hope she's enjoying her retirement. Next is Elaine McRae, who is an information librarian at the Virginia Room, who retired on February 14th. <clears throat> Elaine called the city of Fairfax Library home for almost 23 years. During that time, she closed the old Fairfax City Regional Library and opened up the new city of Fairfax Regional Library in 2008. Elaine spent most of her career at Fairfax assisting uh, countless genealogists and historians with their complex reference questions in the Virginia Room. Just before retiring, she was a recipient of the 2022 FCPL Staff Excellence Award, and they miss her tremendously. So congratulations, Elaine. The third is Darcy Huber, who is not here, information assistant in Kingstown, who retired on March 10th. Darcy joined uh, FCPL in 2004 and has since contributed to various branches, including Martha Washington, Pohick, and Kingstown, with her extensive technical expertise. Darcy played a pivotal role in training the staff on functionalities of the 3D printer. She adeptly handled troubleshooting, printing, navigating the 3D printing app, and imparting knowledge on how to prepare customer files for printing. During her tenure at Kingstown, Darcy made significant contributions to enhancing our adult programming initiative, including initiating the weekly tech help program, which was successfully run by volunteers, and starting the Government Jobs 101 course, providing valuable guidance on navigating the application process for federal jobs. So congratulations. Lien Chow, am I pronouncing that correctly? Library aide at Patrick Henry retired in April. 22, it says, April 22nd, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to read a year in. A year in. The end started as a page at FCPL in 2014, working at the Chantilly branch. She became a library aide in 2017, and from that time until her retirement, she was a friendly face for patrons at many branches, including Oakton, Reston, Herndon, and Thomas Jefferson, as well as her home branch of Patrick Henry. Dubbed the queen of overtime, Mann was always willing to help out when a circulation department was facing a day with too few people. She worked day shifts, night shifts, Saturdays and Sundays with equal cheer, and even was willing to start her day at one branch and finish at another. Her kindness and her easygoing attitude will be missed at FCPL. So congratulations, Mann. And finally, someone we all know, I think, Ted Cavett, who was the Admin Services Division Director in Admin, and he retired uh, May 2nd. <clears throat> Ted had a long and successful career with FCPL. He worked at Lorton, Kingstown, and serving as the head of the system programming and eventually as Mr. Everything in administration. A proud self-declared nerd, Ted channeled his geek energy into wonderful programs like Murder Mystery Night, Bandamanian, huge author talks with the likes of Matt, Max Brooks and Eric Larson. Uh, as much as Ted did for the public, he also created a community of colleagues outside the workplace. Ted played a talented bar, bard in regular FCPL staff Dungeons and Dragons game. Who knew? Right? Uh, where his ability to sing reworked lyrics of a pop song inspired his party to great feats. That's interesting. <laughs> he had an amazing knack for making people feel valued, being on a committee, involved with a program, or just trying their hand at something new. And I knew Ted personally when I was uh, chair of the foundation. He made sure always that those large uh, scale author talks we had and award ceremonies were run so well. All I had to do was get up and introduce people. So it was wonderful having him around. I hope he's well. And congratulations to all those retirees. We'll do this as often as you provide me the information, Jessica. I do hope in the future some people perhaps can come by. Uh, okay. The, yes. Liz? It's Liz. I was wondering if it would be appropriate for the chair or maybe and the co-chair or at least the chair to write a thank you note or card to every retiree and um, if a district representative would be interested in doing uh, a letter or a note to a retiree that uh, retired from a district uh, library, would that be an 
appropriate and, and acceptable. I, I don't know to... how the retirements are run, but I suspect that they get all that paperwork when they retire. I know I did. Every time I retired, everybody came and gave me all sorts of things. So is that is that correct, Jessica? That they've gotten letters I... and things like that. Is that right? But it is. I think Liz is suggesting yeah. on top of that. If oh, on top of that? Mm -hmm. I suppose a, we could. A personal okay. note of thanks for the chair and or the and and or the district. If the district person was interested, like for instance, if I think you said Chantilly was in there, if I had knew somebody from uh, my libraries were retiring, uh, I could write a note of thanks for their service if I had a little bit of data about it, like something that you've read. And then either um, uh, give it to Jessica, or, or uh, I don't know if you'd give me an address, but I could turn it in, and then you guys could mail it to the person's home. I don't know if you'd give me an address or not, mm. but uh, I think a, per a more personalized note of thanks what well, might might be a nice touch. That's what I'm just okay. thinking. Well, it's interesting. We'll certainly think about it. Thanks. Okay. The uh, the other thing I have is, as you all know, we had a uh, a uh, trustee survey uh, covering a couple questions. One was about the 2024 year and whether we want to keep meeting at George Mason most of the time with Kings Park in our, uh, when it's September for the uh, the Friends Choice Awards, or or float around to different libraries. And for the most part, there was. There was no consensus, including the guest or the uh, ghost trustee who apparently voted twice because we had we had one more vote than we have trustees. But that's OK. It worked. Uh, basically, it, it it didn't come up with any, you know, any any recommended change. But what, what I'd like to do and in October is when we'll actually set our our. Uh, schedule for the year. I, I've asked uh, Jessica and, and Suzanne's been involved too, to take a look at, at what we have, because we have a choice. We have 11 meetings a year. In August, we, we never have a meeting. Sometimes we cancel a February. It depends on the weather and things like that. Uh, uh, the meetings in what is it, March, April, and May we have at George Mason, because they're big award meetings and they work well there. The uh, September meeting we have at Kings Park, because it's Friends Choice Award and it works well there. Um, so the remaining meetings, we can have two of them virtual. This is the June meeting. I, I worry a little bit about the election. Uh, not so much this year. Uh, I don't know. We'll see. But next year, when when there will have to be all uh, some new uh, candidates, we may have to, to vote privately. And I don't know whether we can do that on a virtual meeting. I don't know whether there's some sort of way we can put the button and I think there is in Zoom to, to do an actual private vote, but whatever. Uh, so you know, sometime in the summer, I suppose we'll have a virtual meeting next year. And then uh, perhaps in November, which is good because that's around Thanksgiving and we're all busy with stuff. Um, so, you know, so of the remaining very few meetings, <laughs> do we want to do them all at George Mason or do we want to go to other libraries. And one of the suggestions that someone made and Jessica uh, sent along was that we go to the libraries that are due to be refurbished so that when we see them refurbished, we know what they looked like before. <laughs> see what I mean? Which is kind of a cool idea. So that's a possibility. Anyway, we'll we'll discuss that, think about it. If anybody has recommendations, oh, feel free to, to send them in to, yeah. Well, maybe right. thinking about um, the winter months when the weather can be really nasty for travel might be a good idea to kind of hold that uh, as a for possibility virtual. for the virtual. No, I, I, I would agree, except that, you know, there's also the summer months when people are out of town and there's the, you know, I, I know yeah, that, that's a good idea, but, you know, we'll have to, we'll think of all these things, but that was one of the parts. I hate, survey. you know, and yeah. I just have to say, I, I hesitated to vote since, um, the George Mason Library is like ten minutes away from me, and I know so I you felt didn't guilty. Vote? Uh, all that. Yeah. Did you? <laughs> so, did you vote? Well, I might have voted twice. I don't know. Oh, <laughs> uh, maybe you did. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> Out of yeah, guilt. I, I would just assume. You know, we all kind of automatically go to George Mason. Look at Liz; she's there. Yeah. Tonight. I mean, it's like if, if you know, if a, a meeting comes up and we got to man things in our lives, it's nice to say, okay. 
I'm going to this place and have this meeting. So, you know, my, my preference is kind of to stay in the same place. But on the other hand, I understand the idea that it's nice to have it in different places that are 10 minutes away from other people's houses. So yeah. We'll see. Uh, the second one was a question on trustee orientation. And uh, I don't know whether you're going to speak about this, Jessica, or not. But, but uh, most people seemed happy with the way they were oriented. There were a few suggestions, the one being a warm handoff, which would be the predecessor uh, trustee who's leaving the board could speak to the new trustee who's coming on. I would hope that would get done when it's available, <clears throat> but sometimes people leave for other reasons. They're move away. They're upset. You know, there's a lot of reasons you leave the board and you don't want to be involved anymore because you don't have time. And so a new trustee gets appointed some months later, you don't want to be called back to, to talk to them necessarily. But that is a possibility and they can be uh, put together, I think, and, and talk to, excuse me. Uh, some of the other things, what did you say was a good idea, Jessica? I'm trying to read it here and I've lost. You've mentioned something. There were a lot of great ideas in yeah. there. Um, some of the suggestions were to provide some video overviews of yeah, that's different right. branches yeah. or segments of library work so that trustees can go back when yeah. you're a little more inoculated to being on the board uh, mm -hmm. and, and watch those if you'd like, as well as um, spreading out the orientation process over like three to six months so that you're, yeah. you know, you get the big chunk at the start, but then maybe more information as you settle in a little bit more. Yeah. And we, we, of course, always have the vice chair or any of us who are available for questions. If a new trustee has questions, we can, we're certainly always happy to, uh, to handle those. So, so we'll, we'll, I appreciate your taking uh, the time to respond to the survey in both questions. And uh, we will perhaps do that again in the future when we have questions. So now we'll go to committee reports and I'll go in order on the schedule. I'll also add one because Liz uh, is going to give one for the Library Foundation because they just had a meeting. So it makes sense for her to give us one. So first outreach, Sujatha, do you have anything? Um, again, we haven't met yet, but I could just let you know that we are going to meet on the 23rd. <laughs> On the 23rd at 11 o'clock <laughs> at uh, Tyson's Pivot. Yeah. And you all are welcome to come join in. Yeah. But that's all I've got. Okay, thank you. Now it's the nominating committee, but I don't see Keith. Is he not here tonight? He Sue? called yesterday regarding uh, this, and he said he was going to yeah. be used. Yeah, 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 I know. He's supposed yeah. to run the election. So, yeah. Sue, guess what? Yeah, I, mean, I was going to say that uh, I emailed. We, Communicated via email, and yeah. I can tell you what we have so far. Okay, that, well, tonight, yeah, okay, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that um, I think the current leadership is uh, willing to run again, and yes. others have not said that they want to uh, jump into the race, I guess. Okay, well, we, we need to hold the election tonight. <laughs> So that we start in July. Am I right, Jessica? I'm not speaking wrong, right? So that we start in July with the new leadership. So, uh, Sue, do you feel? I thought the vote oh, was in July. I'm sorry. Say that again. I thought the vote was in T July. today. They're presenting no, slates. That's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then Wait there's a, a vote I'm on confused. the slates, yeah. and yeah. then the new the new uh, positions take their leadership role on yeah. July first. Yeah. yeah. So so it is June. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yes. So, Sue, can you <laughs> can you nominate? Yeah, you get to do it. Yes. Guess what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> thanks, <Okay>. Keith. <laughs> um, <laughs> for chair, um, we nominating Brian. Uh, for vice chair, Suzanne, and for the foundation representative, Liz. Okay. You have to get a second. Well, no, you don't need a second because that's out of committee. So now you just ask for. Who votes? Nominations right. from the floor, I think. Right. Oh, nominations that's right. From yeah, the as floor. for nominations from the floor, does anyone? Yeah. Any nominations from the floor? <laughs> uh, I don't see any. Okay. See any. So okay. now you call for a vote. Uh, all in favor say yes. Aye. Yes. Aye. Aye. Sorry. Aye. 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 All opposed 
say no or nay? Let her know what we say. There you go. That's it's either one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate it. And I don't know where Keith is. I, did he call at all? Hmm? Not that I am aware of, no. Yeah. And he did he, not he know was him. planning to be here tonight, I know. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sue, for, for okay. taking care of it. And thank you, everyone, for voting for us. We will continue forward for the year. So policy committee, we have Gary Russell. Gary, you're muted still. There's a The policy committee met uh, on May 15th for the purpose of uh, receiving input from the staff. Uh, that input was very positively received. The uh, two amendment or the two uh, policies were amended um, and uh, reported uh, back to the full board with unanimous enthusiastic support. And we hope that uh, in the July meeting, they will be approved. Thank you. Fan, Ran? Yes. <laughs> Fan, do you have anything? Yes, I do. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> um, we met on we May, can... May... What? Oh, I'm sorry. Are we doing anything? Are we doing anything with these two policies? Yeah, they become consideration items on this schedule. For next month. They're attached, okay. right, and we vote on them next month. Go okay, ahead. and if we Go have ahead. a minor changes to that, should we uh, feed that to Gary directly? Sure. Okay. Brand? Okay, thank you. Um, we met on May 16th, and mainly for the purpose of evaluating um, what went well, what would we change, and um, things like that. So um, we felt the process went really well because we were successful in getting an infusion of funds for the collection budget. Then what would we change? Um, we felt that we, we should work on growing the number of advocates um, and that would mean um, trustees to identify more advocates if possible. So be thinking about that over the summer. We won't be meeting again until September. Um, so, you know, as you're in conversations with people, like, you know, here's what we did, here's what happened, and if you'd like to participate the next time in the budget, you know, that would be great. And then send your name. You can send them to me or to I or Bobby, I would say. Yeah, Jessica, that'd be okay. Um, and since this will be our second year, we can plan a little bit earlier so we don't feel that sense of rush of getting the letters written getting everyone engaged and all that in the budget process because we were really it was really a rush thing um encourage oh and encourage trustees to make personal pitches to the board members because of the people i know who did that i think that was extremely successful and so that's another thing and mm -hmm. i don't know on how many districts that you may have be I know in Mason District, we'll have a new um, supervisor and I don't know about the other mm -hmm. districts. So that's something to think about. And also, I don't know what that means in terms of whether the new, you know, with the new supervisor, if if all appointments are sort of washed clean and the new supervisor can say, thank you very much for your service, but now I'm gonna appoint someone who did a lot more to help me get elected. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, I'll just wait and see. Right. Well, that's entirely. <laughs> up to the supervisor because mine yeah. changed while I was here and he just he was more than happy not to have to worry about it yeah yeah and I know I, and I, I'm talking like you know it's the November election mainly because in Mason District it's a Democratic primary which will no doubt determine will be the winner in November as well but anyway um Oh, and we want to work on incorporating the friends of the library um, earlier in the process we you know we were just um, not ready to do that um in a comprehensive way and um because of getting just getting started so you know we're hoping to start earlier on that um find a way to fund items like hats stickers and signs and i see zandy is here so he can be thinking about that for the foundation <laughs> <laughs> formal yeah. request there thank you fran um, and also, in terms of the friends, also orchestrate an in-person attendance further in advance for budget hearings because, um, you know, by involving the friends and having sort of personal contact with them, we may be able to encourage. I think um, Phil had a great idea of a, of a bus, you know, stopping at the government center on budget hearing day and 
all these friends um, <laughs> emptying out of the bus and oh, going yeah. inside. So, um, <laughs> and then also at the same time, providing templates or support for video uh, budget appearances, because a lot of people do that, um, and that would be really good. And also focus more on youth um, involvement and voice, um, like the teen advisory groups at the different libraries. Um, so those were some of the things that we're looking at um, adding to our um, to-do lists. Um, we also talked a lot about how will we measure what was successful um, so that as we report, as we request again, we can say, because of this money, which we hoped would reduce the wait time for holds, we were able to reduce holds on popular books by X amount. So Jessica was already on top of that. And um, we talked about the idea that with the 300,000 extra dollars going mainly for that purpose, because that's what we um, asked for, then that would leave a nice chunk of money for collection building. And I know a concern of mine is um, homework support, especially in low income areas. So um, whether we'll be able to track, we haven't really talked about that too much, but mm. you know that may be a corollary of 300,000 here means there's more he over here for something else. Um, and then we did, um, I think that, well, the other thing we did, which we sent out already, and that was the questions, if you wanted to ask politicians questions and when they have their um, political events. Um, so that's it. So taking the summer off and see you in September um, to get back down to work, which is when the finance committee meets, and we'll be working with them in terms of that's like the, sort of the beginning of the budget calendar for trying to get more money. So that's what we were working on. We haven't, we didn't stop. Okay, thank, thank you. And Liz, do you have something for the foundation meeting? Yes, I do. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Uh, in terms of the foundation's budget for this fiscal year 2023, they're uh, right now looking like they might end up with about a $50,000 surplus in their operating income, which is really good. That means that uh, they're not going to fall short. Um, and for 2024, with the projection of expenditures, they are looking at being about 74,000, just a slightly over $74,000 short of funding. And they're hoping that uh, some of the efforts that they plan on having in 20, uh, 2023, 24 will make that up. There were four members of the foundation board that their term is expiring, including the, the vice chairs. And um, they, I did, I think that they serve two terms of two years apiece if they are willing to do that. So it's a four year uh, commitment at the most, and then they're automatically, um, their uh, service ends. Um, and then you can come back at a later date, but that is where a cutoff is. And I think they have to be out for at least a year before they can be reconsidered. Uh, they are considering how they can improve uh, keeping in contact with ex um, board members so that they're still engaged on volunteer efforts and other activities. And I thought that was very smart that they're uh, trying to figure out a way to stay in touch or have the ex um, board members remain uh, connected to the foundation. And I don't think they have uh, specific plans yet, but that would be an interesting thing for us to even consider. They or, uh, voted in a new board member who will be replacing the current person uh, who is the finance chair. So they picked a, uh, it looks, he looks very strong on paper to be the new finance person. So right now, I believe, I could be off by one figure, but I believe they have 17 uh, regular board members, three officers, and then three ex officio members. Um, again, they can have a maximum of 30. They have some really interesting and aggressive plans um, for programs and events and appeals for 2024, their fiscal year 24. Um, I won't bore you with the ongoing kinds of things, but they do plan on having a fall for the book event in October of this year. And they're hoping uh, again to uh, uh, reach 200 um, uh, participants. 
And it's, it would be a, an awareness and an outreach fundraising event. And they plan on participating. And I think they have for several years in the Fairfax City Fall Festival in October. Uh, they hope to sponsor a, the children's stage. And they hope to raise money off of things, uh, trinkets that they're selling from the foundation on their booth. Um, and right now that's their schedule for October the 14th. They also plan on having a foundation month. I haven't heard of this before, so maybe this is new. Um, and that will also be in October. And they uh, hope to have uh, promotion material, video displays, brochures, banners, and buttons in library branches. Um, they hope to have staff appreciation, a uh, prepackaged gifts um, uh, for the staff and a display in the government lobby. And again, that's public awareness and outreach and what they call friend raising. Another uh, uh, thing that will be ongoing, which is uh, uh, true, is the always the annual appeal. So they'll be mailing out holiday cards, ad advertisements. Um, we did mail out personalized cards, holiday cards last year where we wrote to um, uh, participants who had contributed money in the past but hadn't donated in the last few years, so we wrote out personalized uh, uh, notes. I'm, we're not sure what the return on that was, but they're hoping to raise $80,000 on those kinds of uh, mail or appeal. They plan on having a Giving Tuesday in December, and that's where there's that Amazon wish list of, of books that the library provides uh, of, of what they're short of. And they're hoping that this year in December on the, the Giving Tuesday, they'll raise um, uh, or get uh, 480 books um, purchased for the library. And I believe that's, been, that's a, a higher figure than before. Um, in January through April, um, I don't know how this is gonna impact us at this time, but they would like to hold a scholarship brunch. At the end of June, a lot of details need to be still worked on, um, and uh, but that is one of their they're hoping that the uh, scholarships that we give out the, that we can make a bigger uh, uh, to do over it and um, recognize the people that are getting those graduate and undergraduate um, uh, scho uh, scholarships. Again, I'll let you know more information as it appears, but they're hoping to do more. And uh, if it's independent of us, I'm hoping that uh, we will all be invited to participate. The cinema in the community, there's a commitment for at least one. That's an extremely popular event. It's coming up again on June the 24th after the Children's Festival and at Chantilly High School, uh, Chantilly Library, excuse me. And there, if they have enough support uh, funds as well as people, volunteers, they would like to hold too because they're getting a lot of feedback from the communities like, where is our second cinema? Uh, regarding uh, the foundation literacy initiatives, uh, they'll continue to uh, do the read, ready to read program. Again, trying to get more sponsors for that. Uh, they did not implement this year the Born uh, with a Book. That was the concept of picking out a hospital that is in a um, uh, south, uh, southeastern section of Fairfax County, more of one of the uh, uh, lower income areas where every baby that's born in a hospital would get a, I guess, a little basket, including a baby's book um, and maybe something else with it. Um, to take home with a new baby to encourage literacy right from the get-go. That they're hoping to get sponsorship and get it organized so that they can implement that in 2024. The, uh, of course, the Summer Reading Festival, they hope to have that. And I think Jessica, maybe under, under the directors, will talk a little bit about the Lorton uh, event that we had. But they hope to, uh, again, in June of 2024, to have the Summer Reading Festival again to encourage uh, children, especially children's literacy. I'm not going to, uh, the other ones, I, I don't even know what they are. I'll just list them out real quick. Um, Library Fandomania is scheduled for May of 2024. 
Uh, again, they're looking for a sponsor, but I have no idea what it really means. Nova Maker Fair, F-A-I-R-E, in the spring of 24. Again, it's not clear to me what that really is at this point, but when I know, I'll let you know. And that's about it in terms of the varied and really um, well thought out of uh, activities that they plan in terms of uh, uh, building awareness, relationships, as well as uh, the critical one of fundraising. Thank you. Yeah. That was all I have for you. Thank you, Liz. I appreciate it. Uh, okay, if we're done with all the committee reports, now I'll turn it back over to the director for her. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Well, I will hop right off of what Liz um, shared about the Foundation's Children's Summer Reading Festival. The first one for this year was last weekend, Saturday, at the Lorton Library. I don't know if any of you have the opportunity to attend. I, I was there for about an hour or so, and Good golly, it was hopping. So the <laughs> event ran from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and I didn't get there till at noon. And I thought, oh, that'll be good timing. The parking lot will have started clearing out. Like I can be leisurely about things. Incredibly wrong. Um, if, if you have been to the Lorton Library recently or you remember it from the grand opening day, there is a fairly sizable parking lot. Uh, and then behind the parking lot across from the library and the community center, is a playground and a large grassy field that is maintained by the park authority. So the festival was held in the grassy field and the parking lot was entirely full. You had to park across route one in the uh, baseball fields. So my husband dropped Hannah and I off, we hopped out of the car and all of humanity was there with us. They had uh, 1600 registered participants Wow. which is enormous for us and is certainly a lot of people to cram into three hours and it felt like half of them were there for that hour that I was there but it was incredibly wonderfully happy emotions from everyone um, it was a free event for the community that the foundation sponsored in in collaboration with several friends groups who um, who buddied up to help pay for it so you know the Burke friends um, sponsor the Kingstown friends city of Fairfax and at least two or three others, I will send you all their names as well, as well as some corporate sponsors, including Cox. And um, it was just such a nice way to start off. There was a bounce house and a face painter and a balloon artist, and a petting zoo, uh, large people-sized board games like Connect Four and uh, Jenga, um, and lots of community sponsors there, like the local uh, volunteer fire department, the police department, and some community organizations, uh, food trucks, Free cotton candy and popcorn, just really fun. As well as, of course, book stuff. Petting, there was a story book. Hmm? The petting zoo was there. Yes, there was a petting zoo as well. Um, and it was just super duper busy. In addition to the library's event, it was also the first day of early voting at that site. There were baseball games at the baseball field. It was Supervisor Stork's office hours, and the community center was hosting a birthday party. So just Lots of happy energy everywhere. If you have the opportunity to do so, um, and maybe you have a young child that you can tag along with you, I recommend attending the next one. It will be on Saturday, June 24th from 4 to 7 p.m. at the Chantilly Library and will be immediately followed by their Cinema in the Community event, which will be the uh, Frozen Sing Along. Spectacular. So I guess we all as adults could participate in that as well. But in general, uh, the foundation uh, board and staff seem very happy with how it has worked out. Um, they were able to raise enough in sponsorships to cover costs this year, which was what their goal was. And uh, from the library's perspective, it's been incredibly successful. We had 240 summer reading registrations just at the Lorton event, which was fantastic. Um, in addition, and there were many. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, Liz? I was just going to say there were more people that came than that were registered. People just showed up and they took such wonderful, fabulous pictures. It just made you th thrilled in terms of the, the, the look of the children that were there, the parents that were there. It seemed like such a wonderful program. You could experience just through the pictures if you weren't there. It's really great. And uh, the staff that are involved, both on the foundation side and the library side, 
uh, certainly heard some feedback from participants that, you know, it was so popular that there were lines in many instances. So they're looking at doubling up on some of the adventures that are there, like the moon bounce and the face painter. So fingers crossed that we can work that out for Chantilly. Uh, in your packet, I included a couple of items I won't go through in extreme detail, but you have an overview of the summer reading program. There's still time to sign up if you're interested. If you liked Beanstack, you can use that. And if you did not like Beanstack, that is okay too. You can pick up a paper log at your local branch. I also included a list of upcoming author events that we have in June, and I think I touched briefly into July. No, the, just June. So we've got a couple of really good ones coming up, some virtual, some in person, so just at your leisure and interest, as well as just a brief overview of some of the celebrations we have going on for June, including Pride Month celebrations and uh, events that we have for Juneteenth, although we will be closed on Monday for the actual holiday. In addition to the things through in your board packet, I had a couple of other updates to share with you. Um, we talked about the survey results and the summer events, both of which were very exciting. Either last meeting or the meeting before, I shared with the board that we are engaging in a process with the friends groups to sign five-year extensions of their memorandum of understanding with the library board. At this point, we have the majority of them signed and the remaining few are all just in negotiations or they're having upcoming board meetings. We have not had any large issues or um, areas of consternation for your colleagues on the friends group. So that has all been moving along very swiftly and many thanks to your chair, Brian, for being willing to sign them virtually. So <laughs> just sign off on them electronically and be ready to go. Um, we also had a wonderful event a couple of weekends ago at the Pohick Library, the uh, space naming for Yo Atkins. It was a delightful little afternoon, and her family came out in full force. Uh, it was a, an Atkins family reunion at the Pohick Library, in addition to having the space naming ceremony. If you did not have a chance to come, right now we have a plaque up on the wall dedicating the space to Yo and her husband, Bob, for their many years of dedicated service on the, the Friends Board and Yo's work as well with the Foundation Board. However, our plan is to still see if we can find some way to do a mural in that space. Uh, right now, it's this beautiful bright blue pop of a wall with these um, decals up that are, they're hot air balloons. They have like chickens flying them, which is uh, very funny and very silly and the kids really like it, but we think a mural will work nicely as well. So we are continuing to work through that process. The only other update I wanted to share is um, kind of a continuation of some of the prior conversations I've, I've, I've had with several of you individually and with the board as a whole. Um, you all are going to consider later on today uh, updating your, your policies S and uh, G, which are around our collection development and our reconsideration process in the goal of really strengthening those policies to ensure that they are both reflective of the work that you want staff to do and that they are uh, ensuring that we have a deep and broad collection that you know is a good fit for most of the people in our community with lots of different titles available for folks. And I've shared in prior meetings that you know there are definitely concerted efforts right now to uh, ban books and to effectuate censorship and to pull libraries into this space that is really political and that none of us are really trying to be in. And I have a really unfortunate example from very close by that happened last night. So the um, Samuels Library, which is the public library in Front Royal, which is just a quick hour's journey west of here, um, was recently, maybe a month ago, six weeks ago, so now at this point, um, there's a community group that has been um, very actively submitting requests for reconsideration and they've been going through the appropriate process. They just have uh, been doing it very... Mm, In a honestly. focused manner. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm trying to find the right words for it. So they've submitted, uh, I think it was over 500 reconsideration requests in a very short period of time for, uh, you know, uh, about 130 different books. And this is a very small library system. They have one branch and a handful of staff. So they've been working through the process, trying to ensure that they're giving appropriate feedback and reviewing the materials as, as is their policy. And um, when that was not moving forward, maybe as, as quickly as was hoped by some of the community constituents, <laughs> they instead went to their local board supervisors public budget hearings and requested that the library not be funded to ensure that those materials were no longer available for people. So that meeting was about a week ago 
and it was the public hearing process that they're they are a nonprofit library system that happens to get the majority of their funding from their local uh, county board. And at their meeting last night, the Board of Supervisors voted to um, only partially fund the library. So instead of the million dollars that they get annually from this local Board of Supervisors, the board is only willing to release 25% of their funds for the first quarter. And they will uh, determine whether they're going to release additional quarterly funds later if. Uh, the library has made changes that they want to have in place. It's just incredibly disheartening. Um, and our poor colleagues that work out there are going to have to figure out a way to, to make this work so that they can continue to keep their doors open and meet all of their community members' needs. So I just, I share this not to be kind of a, a buzzkill for the end of my director's report, but to remind us all as you, you lead into your policy consideration that uh, things like efforts at censorship are not really as far away as we think they are, and that it's our our obligation as staff to ensure that we have a collection that that hits all of the different sectors of our community, and that the policies that you all craft really help us do that. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any comments? Or, oh, Suzanne. Uh, yes, um, Jessica, are, I understand you're going to be talking at the Liberty Celebration in Vienna next week. Is there going to be anything new on the Patrick Library, Henry Library that we haven't heard yet? Thank you very much. I did not mention that and I should have. The town of Vienna, <coughs> um, excuse me, celebrates Liberty <coughs> Amendments Month from um, middle of June through middle of July. And the second week, the week of June 25th, they've actually labeled as Library Week in Vienna, which is delightful. And on June 28th, which is two Wednesdays from now, they'll be having a public event. It starts at six o'clock and it's the Vienna Community Center. They're going to start off with an author talk from uh, Chris Barbashak and Suzanne LaPierre, our Virginia Room library staff who wrote the desegregation of Northern Virginia Libraries book. So they'll be talking about that. And then we'll take a brief intermission and then it will segue into an unveiling of the design plans for the Patrick Henry Library. These are substantially the same plans that you all have already seen. Uh, there are some very minor adjustments to it uh, based on requirement changes that have come up for the space, but it's very, 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 very close to what you all have already seen. The next uh, update that this board will get will be this fall. As we finalize design plans, we'll be coming back to the library board and to the town council and Supervisor Alcorn's office to ensure that we are all set before we start on the construction document process. But you're all welcome to come to the event. It's going to be fun. Where did you say it was? At Patrick Henry or at? Or? It's at the Vienna Community Center, yeah, okay. which is just, just around the corner. Yeah, I, I know they're all close together. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Suzanne. Yeah. Thanks. And thanks for the reminder. Any other questions or comments on Jessica and the director's report? What is the date that you said? It's Wednesday, June 28th. Okay. Okay. Now we have, uh, there are two consideration items in our package. These are the uh, policy G and S that uh, Gary referred to earlier and Jessica referred to. Uh, please take a look at those. They're consideration items. We'll vote on them in July. So take a look at those. And if you have any comments, feel free to send them to, to Gary, uh, probably copying Jessica and, and Bobby wouldn't be a bad idea. <laughs> and me if you want, I don't care. But uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, have actual discussion and vote on them next month. Okay. Uh, yes, Phil. You're muted, Phil. If we have comments, like I think like this is a draft, and let's yeah. say I make a comment, and then you know, maybe there's a change, do you have to postpone it again, or you? No, we can still vote on it. We just somebody agrees with the comment, we can still vote on it. Right, we can still vote on it next month. We can vote on the change if it's substantial, or or if it goes to the committee and and the staff, and they think it's fine. It just clarify something then we don't have to worry too much about it we can still vote on it in july though we don't have to keep kicking it down the road and i would rather not so yes thank you yes Phil. any other comments or questions on these 
Well, again, we don't have discussion tonight. That's next month. Okay, let's do our round table. I want to welcome Keith. <laughs> hey, Keith. And uh, your your partner, uh, Sue, did a wonderful job, ran the election, so we all got <laughs> not a problem. Uh, Keith, do you have anything for the round table? I'll start with you. No, I, I wish I had a good excuse for why I was late, except I was on a great interview with a candidate and I lost track of time. So uh, my apologies. Um, I hope it was a very good candidate. It, it and, and I, good. Understand, I understand that. I've had it's, it. it's probably going to be a good hire, but I wanted to thank uh, Sue for, you know, our coordination in the past uh, month and for delivering um, the results. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Keith. Uh, I'm just going to go backwards on my screen here. Liz, do you have anything for the round table? No, I don't. Okay. Sue, do you, uh, Phil, I'm sorry. Phil, do you have anything for the round table? Yes. Um, I, I should have commented when Jessica talked about the security thing, but the, I went by the Pohick Library uh, on Monday, mm -hmm. and they take me back into the back room and show me the... Uh, whatever you want to call it, the security uh, you know, camera, yeah. pole, whatever they have back uh -huh. there. People. Uh -huh. People. Yeah, they yeah. were so, uh, so excited and so happy that it was there. And so like, I, I don't know if I had to. They said, come on back. And they wanted to show it to me. So <laughs> I just thought I would, would, would share that with you. So I think it's something, you know, when we're talking about all these security issues, that was a big issue for a number of the staff at Public because you you're way back in the in the back, you know, theoretically sometimes maybe by yourself, and you know you're supposed to open the door. So they were very happy with that. that's that one. Okay. Reflect. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Kripa, do you have anything? I have a question that is not related to any of our agenda items. No, but... Okay. That's okay. what roundtables for. All right. So two weekends ago. I'm part of this amateur theater group, and we did a stage reading of a Midsummer Night's Dream in Chantilly. Like, it was not officially affiliated with the library, but I'm wondering if it's possible to make these things officially library sanctioned because it makes Shakespeare a lot more fun and accessible to the public. And we like to do it around different libraries through Fairfax, and it, it's an opportunity, it's a learning opportunity. Yeah. Also, it's fun. Yeah. I will reach out to you after, well, probably not after tonight. I mean, I'll reach out okay. to you. All right. Perfect. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thank you. Sue, do you have anything? Uh, nothing to add. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Sue Jaffa, do you have anything? No. Oh, my goodness gracious. Somebody's going right by. Suzanne, do you have anything? I have a couple of things. Yes. I okay. It was Suzanne Lapierre in the Virginia room last week, mm -hmm. and they've sold 400 copies of the desegregation book. Not we enough. also took a look at World Cat while we were there, and it's in the Harvard <laughs> Library, the University of Chicago, and Southern Cal, and a lot of public libraries. And she's had some outreach from librarians around the country, and I suggested mm -hmm. she let her library school know, and they're going to do an article. They've ordered copies for their library and they're going to do an interview with her in their newsletter so it's mm -hmm. that their publisher is very very pleased that's a lot of books in a short amount of time for that press mm -hmm. um very, very good. there have been two deaths of branch former branch managers in the system in the last couple of months one is gene heinrichs whose husband don served on the board before gary came on and the other is Bunny Starr, who was, I don't know, assistant director or something at one point. She worked the regional coordinator. Regional coordinator, yeah. yeah. And she was at many branches. So um, if anybody wants details, email me and I'll send you links to the obituaries. And finally, I let Charles Fagan know because he used um, to work with all of them and he sends his good wishes to the board. Okay. He said he's on oxygen. I asked him if he still got out to the golf course, and he said only the putting green and <laughs> the driving range, but he does get out once mm -hmm. in a while. He said not too bad for a 96-year-old. Yeah. So that's Very all good. I have. Thank you. Thank you. Fran, do you have anything? 
Oh, I just wanted to say that um, Woodrow Wilson and TJ Libraries had um, beautiful volunteer luncheons um, last month, really had a great time at both of them. And then the one at TJ was catered by a, a restaurant from Mosaic. Ne if you're familiar with Mosaic, it's next door to where the Four Sisters restaurant was, but it's now closed. And it's called um, Sheesh, S-H-E-E. <laughs> S H I guess it was sheesh. Yeah, it, was sheesh. Afghan, it was Afghan food and it was just fantastic. And Bill and I went there a couple of nights ago. So I recommend it to you if you want to try something really good. I had the salmon kebab that was fabulous. Uh, good. Thank you. Purcell, do you have anything in the school? Yeah, um, you may have noticed that in Fairfax County Public Schools, it is the season of graduations and field days. Our last day of school is uh, this upcoming Friday. And um, I wanted to give um, an extra special shout out to our public library staff who have come back in wonderful ways to our schools, meeting our students, promoting the summer reading program, being able to do book talks and just introduce themselves to students as friendly faces and invite them to visit the library in the summer. Um, I wish I could remember the name of the librarian because I did not write it down, but my <laughs> school librarian, Amy Talbot at Old Creek in particular, her face was just lit up with the opportunity to be able to um, connect with a public librarian. This is Amy's She's an experienced librarian. It's her first year at Old Creek. And um, she was just aglow with the excitement that and the enthusiasm that the FCPL librarian brought um, to the program. So on behalf of our school system, we thank everyone. We know that there are scheduling situations that sometimes have to be overcome. And our, you know, our students, if you wanna to talk to first grade, they're there at a certain time. So, you know, it, 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 we just appreciate the flexibility that um, our colleagues in the public system um, show us and the support that they show our students throughout the summer. Okay. Thank you, Priscilla. Gary, you have anything? Nothing. Nothing? Okay. Uh, all I have is that on the 24th of June, which is going to be a very busy day, is the 15th anniversary of Burke Center Library. So we're going to have a little celebration. It's not, not the big one, but the 10th and probably the 20th. Will be. But uh, I hope to be able to make some of the other events <laughs> afterwards. So I don't have anything else. If there's nothing else, uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. I see and a second. 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 Okay. It's made and second. Anybody in fa all in favor, I should say. Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Any of any Aye. opposed? No. <laughs> okay. We'll see you next month at George Mason live, a live meeting. And uh, Liz, you can just stay there in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs>